Today on the Johnny Kaberg Show, where did we come from? How did we get here? What brought us into existence? In most high schools and colleges, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is presented as an established fact of science rather than a theory. But today, many leading scientists in their peer review literature are rejecting Darwin's theory for many reasons. One of the most important being the Cambrian explosion of animals, where complex, fully formed animals suddenly just appeared in the fossil record with no prior ancestors before them. Why do some scientists believe that these animals present compelling evidence of an all-powerful designing intelligence in the history of life? My guest today is Dr. Stephen Meyer, who received his PhD in the philosophy of science from Cambridge University as the author of the best-selling book, Darwin's Doubt. We invite you to join us. Welcome to our program. I'm John Inkerberg. Thanks for joining me. Our topic is, why are many scientists today rejecting the standard textbook theory of evolution known as neo-Darwinism? And where did the problems with the contemporary evolutionary theory begin? And Dr. Meyer, I'm really glad that you're here, and I want to start this program by asking you to explain how the fossil record poses a problem for Darwinian evolution. It actually poses two big problems. Right. Well, uh, we've been talking about a doubt that Darwin had about the adequacy of his own theory, its ability to explain all the evidence. And his doubt concerned a major event in the history of life known as the Cambrian Explosion, in which the first major forms or first major groups of complex animals arose very abruptly in the fossil record. And this posed two problems, uh, two mysteries uh, uh, that were really un unresolved by Darwinian theory. The first I like to call the mystery of the missing fossils, because these animals appear very abruptly in the Cambrian layers, but as you go back into the lower pre-Cambrian strata, you don't find any evidence of the ancestral forms of those animals, the simpler forms that you would expect to find uh, according to Darwin's theory, because Darwin expected that the first complex forms of life would have emerged very gradually as a result of the accumulation of numerous slight variations or uh, changes uh, generation to generation. You just don't see, you see the, the accumulation of those changes in the lower strata. So that was a problem. That was a big problem. But there's an even more fundamental problem, and one that we've grown to appreciate in much more depth in the 20th century and 21st century, and that's essentially an engineering problem. How would the evolutionary process have built these complex forms of animal life, especially since they arose so abruptly in such a narrow window of geologic time? And that's in, in my book. I look at both of those two mysteries, but the, more, the, the second mystery is more fundamental, and it's grown very much more acute because of things that we've discovered in modern biology since the, during the second half of the 20th century, since the 1950s. And uh, in particular, things that we've discovered about the information-bearing properties of living organisms and the information-bearing properties of the amazing molecule known as DNA. Yeah. When Crick and Watson came out with this discovery, what did they show us? Well, uh, Watson and Crick made the extraordinary discovery in 1953 that is, you know, world-renowned. It was this, they were able to elucidate the structure of the DNA molecule. And they showed that the DNA molecule had this famed double helical structure with four chemicals running along the inside of that helix. And as most of us learn in biology class at some point, the DNA is a molecule that contains hereditary information, and it has a, a helical structure. Along the outside, there is this, this winding ladder, uh, double helix ladder, made of sh sugar and phosphate. On the inside of the molecule, there are these four chemicals called bases or nucleotide bases. And in 1957, four years after the structure was discerned, uh, Francis Crick put forward, uh, I think, what was one of the most important uh, hypotheses in the history of science. It's called the sequence hypothesis. And what Crick proposed was that these four chemicals that chemists re represent with the letters A, T, G, and C, are actually functioning like alphabetic letters in a written text or like zeros and ones in a section of computer code. 
That is to say, it's not their chemical shape or structure that matters. What matters is the arrangement of those chemicals such that they are able to convey instructions for building all the important proteins and protein machines that keep cells alive. So what you have on the DNA molecule is literally digital code that is going to that provides instructions for building the, the, the crucial parts of cells that allow all life to exist. When you go down that spine, how much information is there? Well, in the, in the human genome, there's about three billion nucleotides. And even on a single, in a single one-celled organism, there is enough information to build a, a minimally complex one-celled organism requires about 500, 400, or 500 proteins. And that's going to compute to several hundred thousand uh, what are called base pairs or individual nucleotide letters in, in, that, in that genetic message. That all have to be arranged precisely. They have to be arranged precisely so that the instruction set will direct the construction of these proteins, these various kinds of proteins that are needed to keep cells alive. And proteins are essentially the toolbox of the cell that uh, some of them process information, some of them build structural parts, little miniature machines. We're discovering inside cells there are literally little tiny machines. There's a form of nanotechnology, sliding clamps and rotary engines and uh, robotic walking proteins. Um, and then some proteins catalyze reactions. These are the enzymes that we hear about. So proteins do all the jobs that keep cells alive and animals alive, but they, are only, they can only be built if the instruction set is right and that instruction set is stored on DNA. Even Bill Gates, when he looked at this, what did he say? Well, Bill Gates has, has said that DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than any we've ever been able to create. And uh, many other... Uh, many biologists have made similar uh, observations. Uh, uh, famed biotech uh, pioneer Leroy Hood has said very, very directly that DNA contains digital code. All right, explain how DNA relates to the Cambrian explosion and what we're talking about. Well, right, I, I used to ask my students a question, and, and if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And they'd say, well, code or instructions or software or information, and all of those are, are, are correct answers. And it turns out that the same thing is true in life. If you want to build a, a, a new form of life from a simpler pre-existing form of life, you need new information, or rather, to put it more precisely, the evolutionary process would need to generate new information, new code. And that raises a big question. How does it do that? How would it do that? How could it do that? And one of the reasons that's such a big problem, a big, a big question, is that the mechanism, uh, the, the evolutionary mechanism, uh, the driving force of the evolutionary process is thought to be natural selection acting on random genetic mutation, Ch changes, random changes in the arrangements of A, C's, G's, and T's, uh, the, the digital characters in the DNA molecule. Mm -hmm. But what we know from experience, uh, experience of computer code, for example, is that if you start making random changes to digital char characters in a message-bearing uh, sequence, you're going to degrade the information that's present in that sequence long before you're ever going to generate something fundamentally new and useful. I mean, just ask yourself a question if you're a computer programmer. If you've got a functioning computer program and you start randomly changing zeros and ones, are you going to generate a new program or operating system? Or are you gonna, you're going to introduce glitches and bugs into the program you already have? Yeah, all our techies in the room are saying, keep the bugs away. Yeah, keep the bugs away. And, and so there's, there's something fundamentally um, disquieting from the standpoint of information science uh, about the idea that random changes in a functional section of code or text could generate something fundamentally new. And, and so that, that's been a, a, a kind of general concern that, that scientists have had about the creative power of the Darwinian mechanism. Can the Darwinian mechanism of natural selection and random mutation really generate new functional code? Because to build a new animal, you need new code. You need new DNA with, with, with digital information stored in those molecules. All right, let's go to the clip where you show what is happening in the cell and how it's programmed with this code. How do you explain the origin of the Cambrian animals seemingly out of nowhere? This isn't just a problem of explaining the absence of evidence in the fossil record. It's also a problem of explaining everything we know about life right down to the level of molecules and cells. The biological structure 
of a Cambrian trilobite was as complex and sophisticated as a modern crab. Its organs included a brain, gut, heart, and compound eyes. Each organ was constructed from specific types of cells. Each cell type was made from dozens of specialized protein molecules. And each protein was assembled from a four-letter chemical code in a section of DNA called a gene. Now, for the evolutionary process to transform a simple Precambrian organism like a sponge with four or five cell types into a Cambrian trilobite with at least 10 times that many different types of cells, that's a huge leap in complexity. And to make that leap, you need a vast amount of new genetic information. Where does that information come from? That's the central mystery of the Cambrian explosion. So, Dr. Meyer, help us understand this. Go back to this thing now of chance. I think Murray Eden at uh, Worcester Institute called a conference in the 1960s, and he was a mathematician, and he called evolutionary biologists, and he had people that were working on the atomic bomb. He had all kinds of scientists there, and he had a question that was bugging him. What was it? Well, Murray Eden was a computer scientist at MIT, and there was a picnic in uh, 1965 where the computer scientists and the physicists and the mathematicians and the engineers were, were talking with their biology colleagues over lunch. And all these scientists with mathematical training were expressing skepticism about the creative power of the mutation selection mechanism. They didn't believe that it could generate new genetic information uh, on the scale that was required to explain things like the Cambrian explosion. Um, and their, their main reason for thinking that was they realized that that uh, uh, random changes in any, what they said, any formal language system will inevitably degrade meaning. And that is because there's a lot more ways to go wrong than there are to go right. If anyone's played Scrabble and you uh, have a pile of letters, you know that if you just reach in and start picking the letters out at random, you're overwhelmingly more likely to get gibberish than you are to get a word. And that's actually because people have worked out the math on this. The ratio of functional words for any of any given length to the ratio of sequences of characters that give you gibberish is really minuscule. It's uh, in the case of a 12 letter word, I think the ratio is one over 100 trillion. One word for every 100 trillion, 100 trillion arrangements of characters that give you nothing but gibberish. So if you start with a word or start with a section of functional genetic text or a section of computer code and you start randomly changing it, you're overwhelmingly more likely to end up with gibberish because most of the sequences are gibberish. And that's the problem that the engineers were concerned about at Wistar. And so this is just not a good way to think about how, how genetic information originated. This mechanism simply is, is unlikely to, to produce anything good in the time we have available. Or as Murray Eden says, it's improbable. It probably couldn't happen. It's improbable on a cosmic scale. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to the clip where you show what is happening in the cell and how it's programmed with this code. In 1957, Francis Crick first proposed that chemicals called bases along the spine of the DNA molecule function as alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in a machine code. This animation shows how this digital information directs protein synthesis. First, a large protein complex separates the tightly wound strands of the DNA to prepare it to be copied. During this process of transcription, a protein complex called a polymerase produces a single-stranded copy of the original instructions. Here we see this copy, a messenger RNA molecule, being constructed inside the polymerase as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. Now we see the polymerase in action from the outside as it spits out the messenger RNA transcript. Next, this RNA transcript approaches and passes through a molecular machine called the nuclear pore complex, an information recognition device that controls the flow of information in and out of the cell's nucleus. Now we see the genetic assembly instructions on the messenger RNA approaching and arriving at a two-part chemical factory called a ribosome, the site of protein synthesis. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. During translation, a mechanical assembly line builds a specifically sequenced chain of amino acids in accord with the instructions on the transcript. 
These amino acids are transported from other parts of the cell by molecules called transfer RNAs, which link specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids. The sequential arrangement of the amino acids determines the type of protein constructed. When the construction of the chain is complete, it is transported to a barrel-shaped machine that helps fold it into the precise shape required to perform its function. After the chain is folded into a protein, it is released into the outer cytoplasm to do its job in the cell. Now, Stephen, looking at that wonderful clip, I bet you that 85% of our audience didn't understand what they were looking at. But they did pick up a couple things. First of all, all of that was happening in one single cell. All right? All of those little machines that you were looking at are in one little cell. They're interconnected. Then they saw code. Your point is, if that code's not right, those machines aren't going to do their jobs because that code, that information, makes them do what they do. And the question you're raising is, where did this complex code come from? Well, right, and what we've understood since the time of Watson and Crick and from what's called the, the period of the 1950s and 60s, which we now refer to as the molecular biological revolution, is that information is running the show inside living systems. It's a little bit like what goes on at the Boeing plant up in Seattle where I live, where the engineers use a technology called CAD-CAM, Computer Assisted Design and Manufacturing, where an engineer will sit at his or her console, write some code for building a particular part for the airplane with the, at an assembly center, and the code will go down a wire. It will be translated into another machine code that can be read by the assembly center. And then, uh, for example, if you're building an airplane wing, the assembly arm may take the instructions and put the rivets at exactly the right place in accord with the engineer's instructions. So you have digital code being written by an engineer directing the construction of a mechanical part. And inside cells, what we have is digital information directing the construction not of airplane wings, but rather of proteins. And proteins, again, are the, the, the toolbox. They're, all the, they, they're the molecules that do all the important jobs inside cells that keep us alive. So the recognition that information's running the show inside living systems has also made us aware that if you want to build a new form of life, like a Cambrian animal, you've got to ha have a lot of new information. Every new Cambrian animal required a bunch of new dedicated cell types. Each type of cell required dedicated proteins. Each new type of protein requires, in turn, new code. So the Cambrian explosion isn't just an explosion of new forms of animal life. It's an explosion of information. And yet there are really big reasons to doubt that the neo-Darwinian mechanism can generate that new information. And in my book, Darwin's Doubt, I go into, uh, I explain the math as to why it's so incredibly improbable to think that a random search for new sections of, of functional genetic text could produce, even on the scale of the entire history of life, even one new gene or protein. Stephen, illustrate that with your story about the thief trying to break into a lock. Let, let me give you a homespun illustration. Imagine we've got a bike outside the building here, and there is a, a but it's locked with a nice four-dial bike lock. Is it more likely that a thief will be able to open the lock as a result of a random search for the combination, or is it more likely that the thief will fail? Now, in a way, it's a trick question because it depends on how much time the thief has to try to open the combination. We know that there's a lot of different combinations. In fact, with a four-dial lock, there's 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, or 10,000 possible arrangements of those digits, only one of which will open the, open the lock. If the thief only has a couple minutes, the thief will, by random means, only be able to sample a very small number of those combinations. And so it's overwhelmingly more likely in that case that the, that the thief will fail. But we could imagine a situation where, say, we gave the, law, the, the thief several days to do it, and he, he was able to sample more than half of the combinations, in which case it would become more likely that he would succeed than he would fail. But what if we change the illustration a little bit? What if we give the thief that same, say, 24-hour period, and now we confront him with this lock, a lock with 10 dials on it? <laughs> now, well, with 10 dials, you'd, you, you're not just adding combinations. You're multiplying by 10 with each new dial. So for a 10-dial lock, 
you actually have 10 to the 10 possible combinations or 10 billion combinations. So even in a day, a full 24-hour period, the thief is only going to be able to sample a very tiny fraction of the, that total 10 billion. So in that case, it's overwhelmingly more likely that a random search will fail to find the meaningful combination that will open the lock. Mm -hmm. Now, the question in biology is, is the situation for finding a new gene or protein more like the first case where the lock is, has a, a reasonably small number of combinations in relation to the time available, or is it more like the second case where the number of combinations is so vast that even with a great deal of time, there's not going to be enough time to sample more than a small fraction of the combinations. And what is it? Well, the, it turns out that the, 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 the biological system confronting us is not like the four dialogue with the day. It's much more like the 10 dialogue. In fact, there's a scientist named Douglas Axe who's given a very precise estimate of this, and he has shown that, the, the, that it's much more like a, dial, a, a bike lock with 77 dials, <laughs> wh which is one for every functional arrangement of those letters in the DNA code, there are 10 to the 77th arrangements that will give you gibberish, that is a non-functional, non-folding amino acid chain rather than a functional protein. And so, the, the, so with, with that many combinations to search, even if you have three and a half billion or four billion years of biological history to do the searching, by a random means, you're not going to have enough time to sample but a small little fraction of the, the, the different combinations. And so it's going to be overwhelmingly more likely that a random search, when relying on random mutation, will fail to find a, even one functional gene or protein in the known history of life on Earth. That's the, the upshot of, of Axe's calculations. And I go into this and in, in, in explain this in more detail in the book Darwin's Doubt. Yeah. We all kind of grew up in public schools and we're taught that evolution life arose by chance, okay? But I can hear some folks saying, you know, there's a small probability that this could have happened, so why isn't it possible? Well, people will look at a number like one chance in 10 to the 77th power, and they'll say, ah, so there's a, there's a finite probability that a, a new gene or protein could arise in the known history of life on Earth. And uh, I... I uh, there's a, there's a flaw in that reasoning. We can never say anything is impossible because there's always a finite probability of, of, of any event happening. But the question is whether or not this is a good explanation or a bad explanation. And uh, I have an illustration for why this is a bad explanation. There's a famous uh, comic named Jim Carrey who in a particular movie uh, is playing a character who's kind of a goober and he approaches a young lady that he fancies and he says to her, uh, what, what are the odds that a a, a girl like me and a guy like you could get together, and he botches his pickup line, and she says, uh, she says, well, not good. And he says, what do you mean not good, like one in a hundred? And she says, no, like one in a million. And he starts jumping up and down, and he gets all excited. He says, oh, so there's a chance. There's a chance. And I sometimes think this is the way our Darwinist friends reason, that just because there's a finite probability doesn't mean that the event is at all likely to happen. And in, and, uh, in the case of the, the idea that random mutations have generated the new genetic information that we need, the, it's, it's overwhelmingly more likely that such a mechanism will fail than it will succeed. And so the hypothesis that such a mechanism succeeded is actually overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. So we, in science, we don't want to, uh, to choose a, a hypothesis that's more likely to be false than true. We want the best and most likely explanation. So clearly, we should be looking someplace else other than the Darwinian mechanism to explain the origin of information. Yes, there's a finite probability, but it's overwhelmingly more likely that that is not how it happened, and therefore we should be looking for a better explanation. All right. Now, you've listened to what Stephen has said today, and next week's program, we're going to test this out with what evolutionary biologists are saying today, such as Richard Dawkins. They're saying that life still arose by natural selection and random mutation, and we're going to illustrate what they're saying, and I'm going to let you respond to it next week. So, folks, I hope you'll join us then.